Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so, Wednesday, we proved one of the best theorems ever to exist, which is that for every prime power, there's a field with that size. And there is just one field. Uh, so, we can call it the field with 81 elements. Um, we, we constructed it as the, the splitting field of this polynomial. And from, from now on, I'm just going to write it. I'm going to write it FPN, F for field. Uh, the book calls, calls it GF. Sorry, <laughs> not that. Um, which is, you probably enter it in a computer. Like it, in, I think that's how Sage calls it. For example, uh, G is for Galois. Uh, Galois, uh, French mathematician who had one of the most interesting lives of any mathematician ever. So you never heard of him, you should look him up. So um, today I'm just going to prove some stuff about um, about finite fields, and then that's going to be it for the chapter. Okay, so um, when does a finite field contain another? Um, so I'm going to answer that. The answer. So you have a finite field. Um, so the question is what other f b to the some things can you find in there? Um, and the answer is you can find you can find a finite field for every divisor of of n and there's only one field in there And also, these are all the subfields. <clears throat> so the answer is um, for the divisors of, of n. So for example, F8 has nothing between it and F2, which is E2, by the way. F16 has F4 in there. And, and so on. <clears throat> um, and then these are, for example, F4, since it's two squared, it's not containing F8 because that's six cubes and two doesn't divide three. Um, F3 to the six contains F3 squared and F2 squared, and these both contain Z3. So basically factor, factor the three here, factor the three, factor the four, factor the six, and that will give you all the subfields. Uh, okay, so proof. So um, if so, if n divides n, how do we find the subfield? Um, what I have to do is note that x to the p to the m minus x divides 
x to the p to the n uh, minus x. And the reason is that x, so let's see, x to the p to the n is a power of x to the p to the m. So really, I mean, I could just, um, I'm just gonna relabel things so that uh, it's clearer. Why don't we just rewrite? Do I want to rewrite? I'm getting I'm confusing myself. Right. So um, I'm trying to show that x to the p to the n minus x is a multiple of x to the p to the m minus x. That's the question. And well, this is the same as just dividing by one, but sorry, by, by one power of x. Minus one. So they're both multiples of x, so just Let's just take that out. So now I have a power of x minus one and another power of x minus one. And the thing is, um, if n, m divides n, the exponents divide each other. Um, because this is, well, So p to the n minus m. I'm dividing two natural numbers. <clears throat> p to the n plus one. So this is an this is an integer. <clears throat> okay. So if m divides n, does x to the p to the m minus x, well, this minus one, divide x to the p to the m minus one. Notice that p to the m minus one, the division I just did. So you keep subtracting um, multiples of m from n. And I know these, everything you get there are multiples of m, so you end at zero. Uh, so this division works out. So um, just call this, now just call this a. So you have that p to the n minus one times a is p to the m minus one, and just rewrite x to the p to the m minus one equals y, just to make your life easier. So then x to the p to the m minus one, uh, well, this factors, this number factors this way. So this is the eighth power of x to the p to the m minus one. <clears throat> so, so this polynomial is y minus one. This polynomial from looking here, it's y to the a minus one. And now we know we know that these two divide each other. Uh, so you add all the powers. 
all the way to one. So plugging everything back in, x to the p to the m minus one <clears throat> is a horrible mess, but it, they divide each other as I wanted to check. Oh no, what? Ooh. Right, yeah. Um, right, why is x to the p to the m minus one? And I'm just not going to copy again what a is. And here you have x to the p to the m minus m minus one. Anyway, they divide each other, like I wanted to show. <clears throat> so, all right, so I'm going to move to a new slide. I have two polynomials that divide each other. Oh, here we are. If m divides n, x to the p to the m minus 1 divides x to the p to the n minus 1. So now I look at the field with p to the n elements. It is the splitting field of x to the p to the m minus 1 over the field with p elements. So it contains all the roots. That's what being in the splitting field amounts to. Um, and it contains all the roots of, of this polynomial. Then it must contain all the roots of its divisor. So the small exponent is an M and the big one is an N. So if it contains all the roots of some polynomial, uh, that means that it contains the whole splitting field. Of x to the p to the m minus x, which means it contains um, the finite field with p to the m elements, which is what I wanted to prove. Oh, shit, that's a centipede. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go whack it. All right. Um, so <clears throat> it contains the, the splitting field of this polynomial. It contains all the roots. Uh, it contains all the roots of any divisor. So we can see the whole splitting field. Um, also, um, since we've shown that fp to the m equals the set of roots, it's not just generated. But once you have the roots, you don't need to add anything else to get a field. Um, there is just one field. It's uniquely determined. As, as this set of roots. So there's only one copy of this field in there. If you had, so if you had two different copies that would both contain the roots of the same polynomial. And there's only so many of those, basically as many as, uh, as the degree. <clears throat> so if if n divides n, the field with f to, uh, with p to the n elements contains the field with p to the n uh, p to the n elements contains the field with p to the m elements, and and now let's uh, show the converse. Um, so we have to show 
that if, um, if one field contains another, then n must divide n. This is easier um, because we always have, so proof, we always have one extension inside of another, inside of another. And we've already seen that the degree of fp to the m, so the degree of fp to the m um, over, over zp is just, it has to be m because <clears throat> if a basis over zp has m elements, then the size is m times the size of, of CP, CP because that means that everything has m coordinates in over CP. So you choose m many numbers in CP and that gives you p to the m choices. Um, a vector space over the finite field of size p of dimension m has p to the m elements. Sorry. Um, so you have the the number of options to the power of the number of choices. What am I doing? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and for the same reason, the dimension of fp to the n over zp, which is the same as the degree of the extension, is n. So now, just using that, I have two extensions, one instead of the other, their, their degrees must multiply. And this one is n. This one I haven't said anything about. And this one is m. So if m times some number is n, that just means that m divides n. And that's it. <clears throat> so uh, that's the subfields of a finite field. Um, so the example of the book says, um, look at the field with p to the 24 elements. Um, so to do that, what you can just do is just write all the divisors of 24. Um, here they are. And I can even write which one divides which. Uh, and if you have the divisors of 24 by this theorem, what you have automatically are the subfields of fp to the 24 for any p. Um, it's just whenever one thing divides another, the, the finite fields contain each other. Uh, here we have fp to the three, fp to the six, fp to the 12, and that's it. So the exact same picture. <clears throat> All right, moving on. Yeah. Um, so the next thing I want to show, that's um, the next and last thing I want to show, is that the group of units, the, the multiplicative group, so just remove zero and look at multiplication. This is, this is not just any group, it's a cyclic group. So um, this is true. If you say things correctly, this is just true. 
something is true over any fields that are not finite. Um, if G is a finite subgroup, so it applies also for the complex numbers. So any, any finite subgroup of the complex numbers with multiplication is a cyclic group, for example. Um, uh, just like, or the reals, although the reals only have two finite subgroups in there. Just one m plus minus one, the complex numbers are more interesting. And also, if you want to look at a finite field, just any subgroup of, of the multiplicative group uh, is finite, of course. So the proof, the way to prove this is um, use the use the classification, which I hope I hope you've seen. Of finite community groups. Um, well, you haven't, if you haven't seen it, what it says is that any commutative group is isomorphic to a product of, um, of cyclic groups of order a prime power. So if you've never seen this, I guess you can just believe me that this is true. So um, so the, the number the number of things in G is of course the, the number of things in the product let's call this number N. So n is the product of all these prime, all these prime powers that appear, because the product of sets has a size the product of the of the sizes. Um, so my goal, so my goal is to show that uh, g is cyclic. So um, what do you do? Uh, what you do is um, is you look at the so let's say let capital M be the least common multiple of all these prime powers the the primes could repeat so I'm not just multiplying them <clears throat> so now if I look at every element. Um, every element of element G um, is an mth root of unity, or maybe the identity, the identity of the group. Because if I take, if I if I look at it in the in here, it's just uh, a, a lot of uh, numbers. Might might be one uh, a number, say a one, might be one to the one. A number a two, might be two to the two and so on, a m. And if I multiply, if I, if I do the mth power, so here, so g, so groups normally, we write their products as, um, as a multiplication. But when I write the cyclic group, uh, here the product is, is written by a, um, 
as addition. <clears throat> that, that's the, the group law in, in ZP to the E. So what this is, is multiply everything by, instead of multiplying things together n times, what I really mean is adding them together. And now seems M is a multiple of all of these powers, M times anything is zero. Modulo these powers. So G to the M is, is just zero, which is the identity of the group. Okay, so anything to the M is the identity. So let me just rewrite what I have. G is Z to P, P1 to the E1. And so they are all roots of the polynomial x to the m minus one. So how many uh, how many elements um, can there be? Well, as uh, most as many as roots this polynomial has. There are most um, m roots of the polynomial. So the number of elements of G, which I was calling n, is a most uh, m. <clears throat> All right. So on the other hand, M is the least common multiple of all these prime powers. And the order of the group, like I was saying before, is the product of all these prime powers. And well, the, this is, so the product is a common multiple. So it must be bigger than the least common multiple. So M is smaller than the size of G. So if N is at most M and M is at most N, that just means that M equals N. <clears throat> and, and we're pretty much done because um, if you look at, So now take the element one, 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 one. That's an element in the product. <clears throat> Let's call it G zero. G zero, the, the order of G zero, which is the number of, um, but the, the smallest power that I need to take to get zero, or the smallest multiple here, um, if I'm writing in additive notation, um, the smallest multiple before I get zero, or the smallest power before I get one, is um, it's m, which is also the order of the, the size of the group, because um, m m m m m, which is the power the mth power of g zero is zero if and only if each of these, uh, each of these M's is zero mod, ooh, what am I writing? You want to, you want, each of them is, each of these M's is zero mod the corresponding uh, prime power and therefore, uh, the least common multiple 
of all the prime powers divides m. <clears throat> oh. Oh, shit. oh my god, I'm so. Let's use another letter here. What am I doing? What am I calling two different things? M. What I'm saying is any power is zero if and only if you get zero in each component. So in each component, you must reach a multiple of, of the corresponding pi to the ei. So everything, so this is the same as saying that m divides z, c. So, um, so the order of g zero, which is the smallest c, is m. <clears throat> so, so this element has order this, the number of elements of g. So, um, that means that this has this many different powers because the only self repeating when I get to um, when I get to the identity and if I if I do n many before I get to the identity that means that uh, this element generates g and if it's generated by one element uh, g is cyclic as I wanted to prove All right, so if you look at any any finite field and you look at it as a group with a product after removing zero, this is always isomorphic to a cyclic group of whatever order. <clears throat> All right, let's just finish with an example. Uh, the group has F16, so let's do F27. Um, so F27 is um, any extension of C Z3 of degree of degree three. Um, because now that I know that I, there's only one finite field of order 27, I can take, I know any of these extensions that's order 27, they must all be isomorphic. So um, it is Z3 adjoin alpha for an alpha, which is a root of any degree three irreducible polynomial. And also, I mean, you know that it's the splitting field of x to the 27 minus x. So you could even just um, just find them all, find all these irreducible polynomials. Because now that I, this is Google. This is Google, this is not this one. Uh, Now that I know this, um, I know that every root of this polynomial is is one of these elements, and I know it has a minimal polynomial, which is a factor here. So, if I wanted to find all the residual polynomials of degree three, I would go like this, and well, I have some factors of degree one. But then all of the ones of degree three uh, are the irreducible polynomials. So I can just pick one of those, like this one, x cubed plus two x plus one.
In other words, um, alpha cubed equals negative two x minus one, negative two alpha. But negative two is is one because three is zero. So alpha cubed is alpha minus one. So um, what I know now is that f twenty seven is the set of just the set of powers of alpha all the way well it's zero and then all the set of powers of alpha do i know this um no i don't know this sorry um i know that for some alpha um so what i know is that the multiplicative group is isomorphic to Z26. So the possible orders of an element in there is the divisors of 26, which is 1, 2, and 13. Uh, so as long as, as the 13th power of alpha is not 1, I'll be, um, I'll be good. Uh, but I, I'm just going to show you that it's not. So alpha to a zero is one. Alpha to the one is alpha. Alpha squared is alpha squared. Alpha cubed is, um, is alpha minus one. Right. Oh, here it is. Uh, keep going. Multiply this by alpha. Uh, when you multiply, here you have alpha squared, and then you have alpha cubed, which is alpha minus one. No. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, I thought I could do this in my head, but I can't. I'm inviting more than I can chew. So alpha to the sixth is alpha cubed squared, which makes it one minus two alpha plus alpha squared. Oh, there you go. Alpha to the seven is alpha times this. Um, I'm going to pause. It's terrible. All right, so what was, I actually did that on the first try um, because when I got to alpha to the 13 and I got negative one, I knew that was gonna, <clears throat> I knew that was making sense. And then everything else is just negative one times the previous list. So the 26 powers of alpha, either from zero to 25 or from one to 26, um, give you all elements of, of um, F27, which, well, it's just, <clears throat> here they are. Um, and and this means this means for example that so since f27 is the splitting field of x to the 27 minus x um all roots of x cubed um plus two x plus one are in here. So um, there should be three of them. And, and they're somewhere, I mean, one is alpha and actually I can tell you, I know that the, um, the other two are alpha cubed and alpha ninth. So, um, but then, you know, these, um, these, 
these are all the roots of some other polynomial. So they're all just, well, they're all just in there. Um, I don't know, finding fields are very interesting. Uh, that's it. I'll see you Monday. Stop recording.